excited, okay? We are going to talk about identifying and qualifying potential influencers. We're gonna talk about what kinds of resources we can create for these influencers, as well as a little bit of outreach strategy. That's me with different hair. <laughs> um, I am the Director of Marketing Operations at an Austin-based agency called Apogee Results. We are a full-stack marketing agency, and I love questions, and I will take them all day long, but let's move on. Okay, so influencer marketing. Ooh, it's a new term, right? It's a new thing. It's a, <gasps> no, it isn't, not really. So if we go back in time, way back in time to about 1765, we have our first recorded instance of a celebrity endorsement. In 1765, Josiah Wedgwood was developing the very first really pure ivory earthenware. And one of the first people that wanted it was Queen Charlotte. She commissioned him for this piece of crockery and it became known as Queensware. Well, her husband, George III, really liked it and he ordered some. And then Catherine the Great found out about it and she ordered some and folks, the rest is history. Josiah Wedgwood is probably one of the most well-known. Have you ever heard of Wedgwood? It's very expensive stuff now. Um, that's how Josiah Wedgwood got his start. He got celebrity endorsements. So yeah, this influencer marketing thing's been around for a while. So how do you identify what kinds of influencers are a good fit for you? Well, there are link builders, right? So how many of you are familiar with SEO and we've been doing it for a while? Where are my SEOs? Yay, SEOs, we love link building, right? Link building's influencer marketing. Hey, you wanna share my link? Sure. Uh, celebrity endorsements? Oprah's an influencer, absolutely. But how many of us, let's be honest, have money for Oprah Winfrey? Probably not. Um, what about a professional writer like Courtney Levia? Courtney writes for Bustle. She also writes for Women's Health. She knows New Beauty. Um, Birdie, Hello Giggles. She is a professional writer. She is not a mommy blogger but she is not technically a traditional journalist in the sense of working for a newspaper or a traditional news organization. But as a professional writer for well-known publications online like this, she's absolutely an influencer. So what about those Instagram influencers? Absolutely, yes. This happens to be a friend of mine. This is Ainsley. And she is your typical, what a lot of us think of right now as what an influencer is. She's an Instagram influencer. She's also a mommy blogger. She actually started her blog when her daughter was born. And I don't know whether you can see or not, but her daughter had a feeding tube right after she was born. And the process of taking care of this child really took it out on Ainsley. And one of the ways that she learned how to cope was to write about her experience. And she very quickly found that there were a lot of other parents needing some place to gather and talk and commune. And she wound up building up a fairly sizable audience to the point where now fashion and um, all kinds of things are like, hey, would you pose with our stuff? And she's like, yeah, sure. Am I an influencer? Yeah, maybe. So this is um, an Instagram post of mine. I happen to be a big fan of Tea Turtle t-shirts, and this is an example of user-generated content. Tea Turtle didn't ask me to do anything. I just happen to be a huge geek that loves Wizard of Oz t-shirts. But apparently Tea Turtle thought it was influential enough. They wrote me back and said, hey, we found your post on Instagram. We love it. Would you give us permission to use it in our marketing materials? I'm like, yeah, sure. Free t-shirt, please? still haven't gotten my free t-shirt, not sure what's up with that. Anyway, point being that we need to kind of pause for a moment and think about, okay, what exactly is an influencer? Because it's actually a lot of things. And that's a good thing for us as marketers because we don't have to depend on quite a small a pool. We don't have to take too many risks because there are actually a lot of influencers out there. So the point with this is at the bottom of this, we have a lot, a lot, a lot of influencers that have small reach. So we can think about link building. We can think about user-generated content. That's a lot of people that each have their own following, their own community 
that if you have a lot of them talking about your product, you're actually reaching a whole lot of audience. At the top of this, you have your top quality, we're talking tier one, um, New York Times, ABC News, CNN, top rated media, and celebrity spokespersons like Oprah Winfrey. Like I said, it's very rare. Yes, they have a huge, right, excuse me, huge reach and a lot of impact, but our chances of ever catching that kind of lightning in a bottle are kind of rare, and very rarely do we have the type of money to engage in it. While in the middle of all of this is people like Ainsley and people like Courtney Levia and all kinds of local news media, podcasts. Now we're seeing a lot more web shows. We're looking at Instagram TV. We're looking at Facebook Watch. There's so many more opportunities to find the right influencers. So next step is identifying which of this huge universe of influencers are the right ones for our brand. This is my dog, Gus. Now, Gus is an old dog. He's like over 16, and it takes him a while to do his thing. He'll go over here, and he'll search around. He's like, nope, it's not the spot. And he'll go over here, and he'll search around. He's like, nope, it's not the spot. Kind of need to be a little bit like Gus when it comes to our influencers in that we need to take the time to find the just the right spot, right? But guess what? A lot of this is not particularly cash intensive. There's a lot of things that we can do if we're just willing to invest some time and we can go searching, we can search Google. We can set up listening in Hootsuite. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, and Snapchat all have search functions. These are all places that we can go to start looking for people who are talking about the same topics we are in the same industry but not competitive and begin to create that list of influencers. Things that we listen for when we're trying to find influencers, people, the publications that matter to our audience, as well as topics, hashtags, mentions, possibly industry titles, so this is job titles that we might be looking at, and also who's talking about our competitors and partners. Yes, our business partners can often be one of our best advocates as well as really influential in our space some places that we can go besides the free searches. So how many of you are familiar with Haro? Several of you, I love Haro. Haro is another free option. Basically, in this scenario, you sign up as a source and you get emails every day of journalists, writers, producers that are looking for some sort of quote or expert information. I have landed so many um, influencer connections by answering Haro queries. And this is another one that's no cost. Sometimes though, you need to spend a little money. Um, this is a tool called Nuvi, N-U-V-I, and this is a data visualization tool for social media. So what we're looking at here is um, tweets over time about the masters. The larger the circle, the more influential, the bigger the reach of any particular particular user. This big green dot is PGA.com. Yeah, they have a lot of people following them. Um, color has to do with sentiment, so green is positive, blue is neutral, red is negative. This is also on a timeline, so over time you're seeing where things really get mentioned, and you can also follow trails of when PGA said something, who else continued the conversation. Love this tool. The cool thing about this is that Nuvi charges you based on the amount of data that you pull per month. So it can be, if you're really careful and you know what you're doing, it can be a very cost effective way to find influencers and see their impact very quickly. I also happen to like BuzzSumo and Outreach Ninja. Both of these have both search and outreach functions on them. They are paid tools, but I happen to like them an awful lot. But here's the kicker. You can find tons and tons and tons of people talking about what you're talking about. You can identify influencers all day long. The important part of this is qualifying them. So what, how do I qualify an influencer? Well, first of all, does the influencer match a business goal? So let's think about backlinks for SEO. Let's think about web mentions. Let's think about PR. Let's think about social media advocacy. Each of the 
business goals that you get involved with when it comes to influencers, it really does need to match up to a bottom line goal. This isn't just about vanity metrics. This is about real business and real trackable ways of engaging with influencers. So keep the goal in mind. Are we there for backlinks, web mentions, social media advocacy, or are we there for PR, press mentions? Also what you wanna consider is, is that person really a brand match? So if you are selling sulfate free, all natural shampoo, you don't necessarily want an influencer that's going to talk about dog shampoo. Am I right? So, is the influencer a match to your brand? We want to think about voice, professionalism, visual, and writing styles. So, not only do we want topic relevancy, but we also want to make sure that they are a brand fit. Are they snarky like we are, or are they a bit more professional and buttoned down? Those sorts of things will help us determine, is this somebody sh that should go at the top of the list that I need to spend some time on right now, or should I maybe put them down a little bit lower? There are better matches, there are better fits. A little bit on style. Okay, you've got them identified. You've got them qualified. The next thing you need to do is create resources for these influencers. There is a portion of value exchange that needs to happen. Not all influencer engagements are paid. Yes, you can do that, but consider carefully if sponsored content really is the right choice. There are other methods of exchanging value that benefit both you as a brand and the influencer and the audience that follows them. So, a few examples for you. The first is creating a brand newsroom and doing co-created content. So the idea here is that you continually create content on your website that specifically serves your group of influencers. Those people that need additional resources in order, to, in order to write not only about you, but about the industry that you impact. What sorts of information, what sorts of innovations, what sorts of things can you write about that can then be used as a source by an influencer? Also data and research. So this, this is a fun example, I love this. I worked with Authority Labs for a period of time now. For those of you that may not be familiar, Authority Labs is a search ranking tool. One of the cool things about Authority Labs was that this tool pulled um, rank data based on geography, based on device, based on all kinds of keywords. There was some really deep data and I was actually able to use this tool, I kid you not, with a blogger who was writing about craft beer across the country. She wanted to know, she wanted to research, so what brands, what local places are really serving the craft beer community well in several both like A tier cities as well as B and C tier cities. So we pulled a whole bunch of ranking data for her as to what craft beer breweries showed up in, I think she had like 12 cities that she was researching, but the data that we were able to pull for search that was driving traffic and more importantly foot traffic to a lot of these local places, she was able to use in her article. These are things that you guys can do as well, I promise you. Every one of you represents a brand that has some sort of internal trend data that not the general public has access to so long as you're not sharing something proprietary there are ways to package and present the data that you already work with day in and day out to potential influencers as a way to help them research and write better articles for their audience also expert interviews and quotes so this is more of doing Haro outreach this is doing interviews for podcasts this is doing interviews for live social media broadcasts Guys, there are billions and billions of blogs and publications and written content online. The order of magnitude for podcasts is much smaller. Your opportunity to make a big impact with a small amount of effort really is in the podcasting space. And one of the cool things is, depending on how the podcaster is working, what they do, they could be syndicated to iHeartRadio, they could be syndicated to Spotify, they could be syndicated to um, TuneIn, which is what Alexa uses. So if you want to ask Alexa to play your favorite podcast, you hope that they're on TuneIn. But the really cool thing is the additional SEO benefit of the show notes. One of the most amazing things I've seen is how incredibly high 
the show notes in iTunes podcast rank for certain terms. You want your brand to show up high in searches for topics that matter to you? Get on podcast that's on iTunes. Also, product placement. So for those of you that have consumer products, products that photograph beautifully, you can go find influencers that go camping, they live active lifestyles, and so they'll take pictures of your beautiful product products and all of these incredible vistas that is definitely a way so long as you've negotiated the terms and make sure that they're mentioning you that they're really draw, driving traffic and awareness of your brand product placement is still an excellent way to go also product trials for review so showing you Illumai again because one of the things that I worked with was a couple of blogger boxes so this is a subscription service specifically for bloggers to get um, product to try, things to write about, right? Everybody needs ideation. We did two rounds of a blogger box called Blocks, B-L-O-X-X, uh, -X, Blocks. And we had in each round of the blogger boxes about 30 to 40 people that were willing to take photographs of our product and at least reproduce our one pager that came with the product. Out of each of those rounds, we found that we had, say, four to five that went beyond just retyping the one pager and actually tried the product and wrote about their personal experience with that product. Of those five from each round, so we had about 10 total, we reached out to them again and said, hey, we see that you really liked that little travel size. It was only about yay big. We would like to send you a full-size product that will last you three months in order to get you to write a full blog piece that's just about Illumai and your experience with it. I think of the ten, eight of them took us up on that. Um, and these are people that by the time they spent that much time with the product and that much time with us, we had really developed a deep relationship. We can then go back and revisit them once a year, once every six months when I know since we did this project that Illumai launched a sulfate free dandruff shampoo it, that's a good opportunity to go back to those bloggers again and say hey we've got a new product would you like to try it out and write about it so for those of you that don't have physical product maybe you are a SaaS company you have software let me encourage you to think about okay let's not do the sales pitch not for our influencers but how can we walk somebody through our product our tool our software and help them understand how they articulate the value propositions how our product makes people's lives better help them write about talk about share about your product rather than just sell them on buying it okay so You've identified your influencers. You've qualified which ones you want to spend time with first, and you've developed some sort of value exchange, whether that's cash or whether that's some sort of value that works for them and their audience as well as you. Next comes outreach. So the thing I want to admonish here is don't ask them for something. I'm going to step out of the way so you guys can see. Don't ask these influencers for anything. Instead, Demonstrate the value that you've received from what they do online, whether that is an online publication or whether that's their social media feeds. This is the time where hopefully, after all the research that you've done to qualify them and you know that they're reaching the right audience, they're getting the right kinds of engagement on social media, all those kinds of stuff. By the time you've spent that much time, you can fairly easily say, hey, you're doing really great work. I appreciate and value the hard work that you're putting in to cultivate this audience, please let me help you. Offer to provide them something of value rather than asking them to do something for you. So that's where your data, your expert quotes, your content created around a topic that is of value to both you and them. That's where you make that offer. Hey, you're doing a great job. Please let me help you do an even better job. So. Some examples. I happen to have access to an absolutely incredible project management tool called Griffin. And I wanted to show you guys some screenshots. And I realize for those of you in the back that this is kind of small, but basically this is one of our brand ambassador screens. In this particular software, I can put all of the social media links. I can put the brand ambassador's name. I can keep track of 
when I added them, other relevant links and details, I can make notes. This is what gets me started with social media brand ambassadors and stuff like that so that I can make sure that I engage, that I love on them, that I pour in a little bit to their effort before I ask them to help me out. Once I've got a brand ambassador set up, I can also set up tasks. So I might want to engage my new brand ambassadors that I've qualified. I may just want to follow them around for a while, make sure that I follow their account from my business account, make sure that I spend some time actually reading their posts or watching their videos, liking, sharing, commenting, until they've, they've had a chance to get to notice me. They've had a chance to get to know me. Then I can double down on that and do a little bit of paid social placement. I love paid placement for influencer marketing. So, fun stuff. Just to make sure that you guys understand, influencer marketing works not only for B2C, but also B2B. This, my friends, is an example of how I got um, industry publication to pick up the news for a client, wait for it, that does medical malpractice insurance. Ooh, so sexy, right? Everybody wants it. No, not even the doctors that need medical malpractice insurance want to talk about medical malpractice insurance, but they happen to have a very unique value proposition that they wanted to put out in the press that rather than claims adjusters, this particular company had actual lawyers that helped mediate um, claims against a doctor for malpractice. And so we put together a press release and an article. We published the article on the website and then we targeted news media that writes about the health industry. Now, that particular client does not write um, malpractice insurance in all 50 states, so I limited the outreach to just the states that they write insurance in. I also defined an audience that their main job title was writer, reporter, columnist, senior reporter, correspondent, news presenter, radio talk show host, etc., etc., etc. There's really in Facebook, there is a very nice pile of job titles that define media. And then I qualified them further by saying, of all of these news media people, I want the ones that are most interested in health topics, public health, health promotion, health care provider, general practitioner, clinics, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I wanted to make sure that I was only putting this in front of the journalist audience that was most interested in what we had to say. By the time we did this, I think we ran it for only two or three days. We spent maybe $200, and we wound up getting a press mention in the top insurance journal in the country within like a couple of days of running this campaign. Yay cheap and easy, right? Also, you can do something similar in Twitter. So do a little scraping and follower wonk. This is an example of Twitter users that have the word journalist in their bios. Obviously, you need to do a little filtering. This one happens to have um, somebody from New Delhi and somebody from Islamabad, Pakistan. You need to do a little bit of filtering, but the cool thing with Follower Wonk, doing all this for free, there's nothing paid for here, they have a download option that once you have created your list in Follower Wonk, you download it, and then you can immediately upload it back to Twitter in their ad space and create a tailored audience based on the handles that you just collected in Follower Wonk. Hello! Okay, final way to engage and do outreach obviously is email. And like I said, don't ask for something, offer something. This is an example of the email message that we send out when we're doing link building. When we're looking for a publication to post something about an industry topic and get it to link back to whatever client we're working on behalf of. So for those of you in the back, this message says, hi, I'm Nick. I'm a California journalist who enjoys researching about um, how business strive to remain relevant in today's constant state of flux and chaos. I am writing because I came across your site and I think it is, perf it is a perfect match for my writing interest, so I'm hoping you might find my ideas worth sharing on your site. I'm currently working on these pieces that, you, that might be of interest to your audience. And there's a couple of instances here, let me know if you're interested in. Again, I'm not asking them to do something so much as I'm offering to help create a piece of content. No muss, no fuss. 
We have found that in this particular system, doing email outreach two, three times, if they haven't responded by that third mail, move on. That's why you have a qualified list. If the top ones are like, yeah, no, we, we realize that you like us, but you're not quite the right fit, move on to the next one. What I really like doing, obviously, is a mix of all of it. Spend some time engaging with them organically, do the outreach on paid social, and follow up with email. One of the things I found, particularly with PR, is that by the time the press release has hit their email, they're already familiar with my brand, they're already familiar with the story, they're much more inclined to open up that press release email by the time I've done all of this other stuff. All right, one last thing. So, I have a tool that I really, 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 really like. It's called Griffin. And right now, Griffin is in beta. It, you can go to gryffin.com to check it out and find out all the things. So this, rather than being like your traditional social media management tool, this is more of a project management tool. This is where I can manage my PR outreach, my social media brand ambassador outreach, my link building outreach, and keep track of all of the communication back and forth, who I flagged, what's the next step. Um, a lot of it's automated and will prompt you, hey, ding, 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 it's time to take the next step with this influencer. And because it is actually technically still in beta, they're not asking you for any money to try it out just yet. So I highly recommend. And I also want to let you know, like they told you earlier, I will be speaking at the Zenith Marketing Conference at the end of April. My good, good friend, Joe Thornton from AimClear is going to be co-presenting with me. We are going to be talking about this topic, but we're not going to cover exactly the same thing. So along with some of this introductory information that I gave you tonight, we're actually drilling down into specific um, industry verticals. We're gonna talk about, okay, that's great. So how do I identify the influencers that work for me if I'm a B2C local business or I'm a B2B SaaS company or I'm a nonprofit? Joe and I are gonna talk about this at Zenith and we would absolutely love for you to come up to Duluth and join us for learning a little bit more about influencer marketing. Thank you very much. I will say one more thing. So although I talked a lot about how to create content, how to create resources. If at the end of the day, the right move for you is to do a paid engagement with an influencer, I happen to have a contract template. It's just to get you started. You're still going to have to make sure that you customize it for your engagement with your particular influencers. Make sure that it is compliant with wherever it is that you do business and wherever it is that influencer does business but it's a template to kind of get you started to put together exactly what you expect from them, what they should expect from you, timing on payment, all that kind of good stuff. So if you want my influencer marketing template, you're gonna have to email me. Also, I really like questions. I kid you not, I love talking about this stuff. So if after you've played around in these ideas and concepts or whatever, you're like, what was that she said? Please email me. I'm happy to continue the conversation well past tonight. But obviously, I think we have lots of time for questions now. Yeah, well, and, and just to let everybody know, hey, excuse me, I'm all choked up over there. <laughs> <laughs> He's all the clutch. Yeah, we have your slides. So uh, we'll be hearing those. So don't worry, right? So yeah. slides will be on SlideShare. Yeah. yeah. And. There's also video if you want to hear my commentary over the slides again. So ask away and just know that all the information that I need to go Cool. Do you guys mind if I put this mic down? I can be loud without it. <laughs> and I talk with my hands. All right, so back here, question in the back. Yeah, I got two questions. Sure. Number one, are you a Certainly. So I guess technically I would have to say yes, I am. I am a user of Griffin. So in this case, this is more like user generated content. I happen to be a fan of the tool because I use it. I love it. It was also developed in Vivo. So there's a personal connection to this. But as far as any kind of remuneration, I don't get any money from telling you about it. I, I love it and I want to share it with you. Yes. Just 
two questions. Uh, one, next month, the Senate is going to have a, uh, in the talk about this, how do you protect your clients from FCC violations? And two, how do you, how do you defeat the fraud? Mm, meaty questions. I like it. Um, a lot of that has to do with communication as far as, as the fraud aspect. A lot of this is social media. There's always going to be a little bit of control that you want to have because it's out there. People are talking about it. it it's tantamount to you having as much control over user-generated content. Somebody talking about you on, um, yeah, on Twitter. On so you kind of have to be slightly comfortable with not 100% control. But at the same time, so long as you develop and nurture that relationship, communication is a lot of what makes sure that there isn't any fraud. Obviously, if you're doing paid influencer marketing, there's a contract involved. Um, they get paid based on whatever metrics you set forth that they have to achieve. And that's bound by the contract itself. Obviously, you want to make sure that you talk to your lawyer, all that kind of stuff, and it's frame in the right way that should you happen to need to take this work. Um, as far as FTC is concerned, so the FTC has had guidelines out there for us for about seven years now, as far as the influencer being obvious that, hey, this is an influencer engagement. I am doing this on behalf of a brand. I have to have a hashtag or, or make it quite obvious by mentioning the brand that I'm doing this as an engagement. Um, so far, the FTC really has it gone all out on keeping track of that stuff. There's just too much chatter out there to really enforce those guidelines. But so don't um, put your client at risk if you don't. Again, that to has to do. Yes, that you framework? can, but that's again that comes back to that contract and that conversation with that influencer. I want to make sure that they are being obvious. A lot of times, particularly with, um, because there isn't a monetary exchange, so part of the FTC guidelines have to do with the value exchange. There has to be a significant monetary result from this engagement as well. So if they're just writing a review about you after having seen a product demo, they're not getting any cash. You're not actually providing any more value than just your time. There are ways to kind of make sure that the brand is protected because they haven't really spent a lot of time. And then circle back around to the um, contract review. Do you put the FTC disclosures in your contract? Yes. And what type of FTC disclosures do you recommend? Um, depending on what we're doing, it, it changes from a little bit depending on exactly the nature of the engagement, but most of the time it has to do with a recognizable hashtag and making sure that they tag the brand properly. Do you warn clients about that this the influencer doesn't follow the guidelines that they could be liable? We talk about it and it's usually very early in the process of do we want to even do influencer marketing? Here's some of the things that could be an exposure issue. Um, they decide at that point whether or not they're concerned about that type of liability or not. If, if it's something that they just are that risk averse to it, then they will do something else other than influencer marketing. But that's a very early conversation with the client before we ever launch into an influencer marketing cool. Any other questions? Um, thank you, Michelle. I enjoyed the presentation. Uh, two questions on the tools. You mentioned a couple on product management. Mm -hmm. Tools for influencers. I'm curious, one, if there's a tool that you can recommend. So you're talking about finding influencers. I think one place to start, at least for us, is like going through our clients' followers right. and seeing out of those followers who are big influencers in terms of followers. I haven't found a tool that can sort my clients' influence, my clients' followers by their followers. Um, follower one can sort Twitter a little bit for you. Instagram. Um, Spark Toro is a tool that is in development right now. So for those of you that are familiar with Moz and Rand Fishkin, Spark Toro is Rand Fishkin's new project. And a lot of what he's doing is in the influencer marketing space and helping to qualify and sort influencers. So spell that. 
S P A R K T O R O, I believe. But if you'll look up Rand Fishkin, Spark Tour should show up. And then, I'm sorry. Second is, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're getting returned. So mm -hmm. we want to make sure that we have um, a coupon code or some sort of tracking code, affiliate code for influencers that are promoting your clients' products. But what do you recommend there for software? Um, so some of it's going to depend on exactly what your outcome is. I know for, for some in here, uh, brand lift and audience acquisition is more the goal than an actual transaction. So there are different ways to measure that, whether you're looking at tracking traffic through tagged URLs, which certainly you can work with um, your influencer. If you wanted to, you can create the tagged URLs and shorten them for them, get it all packaged to them really nice and neat so they don't have to worry about it too much, especially for um, link building and um, social media advocacy. I, I highly recommend going ahead and setting up your links in advance. Also, just being aware that um, campaigns like this can affect things like direct traffic and organic SEO. You need to be paying attention to when those things jump up in tandem with your um, influencer marketing. Yeah, I understand that. I'm just I'm trying to figure out a tool that we can track sales mm -hmm. on both sides. So if I hire you as an influencer, you know how many sales you're getting and I know how many sales you're getting. Right. Um, then you're getting into more of the affiliate codes type stuff where people are clicking through that code and you know, the influencer is getting their portion of the action based on the affiliate code. It's still probably a solution for that type of thing. Any tools there? Um, off the top of my head, I haven't worked specifically with affiliate and referral marketing like that for a while, and I'm pretty sure that whatever I would have touched three or four years ago, there's much better tools out there now. So that one, if you'll email me and remind me, I'll have my SEO team um, get back to me and tell me which ones they like. Right. But off the top of my head, personally, I can't think of anything to come. Any other questions? Do you have any tips for nurturing an influencer once you already passed the engagement and outreach stage and you already exchanged the value on your end but you still have received their end of the bargain? make sure that I understand. So this is follow up, making sure that once you've given all of your deliverables, you're waiting for the influencer to complete all of their deliverables <coughs> or make that. Okay. Yep. Um, honestly, the project management is a lot of what I like using for keeping track of that because particularly with um, the content tools that I use, I have an opportunity to go, okay, this post has been written. This post has been published. This post has been shared. I can now begin to watch click-through rates and, you know, um, depending on what type of engagement, whether or not we're tracking impressions or any of that other kind of stuff. Um, I keep track of it and let the automated reminders say, hey, you need to check back on that. I will say that with influencers that you're doing some sort of value exchange that's not necessarily cash, sometimes you have to be a bit forgiving on that. and. You may have to wait for them to catch up. I know with Illumine, we had um, one round of the blogger box that it was for new moms, and we actually, one of the bloggers that was contracted to do that project, her baby came early, and so she wasn't able to produce her article and get it published until after the deadline, but she communicated that with us, we understood what was going on, and she was still allowed to do all the stuff and get her benefit out of it. So a lot of it comes down to the communication. And every once in a while, if it's not a paid contract, you're just going to have to be a little bit forgiving and know, okay, I'm not going to use that influencer again because they didn't have the follow through that I expected. So anything on the opposite end like on the influencer side, who comes up with the guidelines for like terms? How many pictures or the content because like being on the opposite side, like I would have my rates. And so like what would I have to give up to like basically accept your guys' side of it? So again, this is relationship marketing. Sometimes it the influencer may already have stated, especially if you as an influencer keep track of how big your audience is, that you're able to show some sort of metrics as to the type of reach, engagement, things that you can expect when you um, work with you. 
they probably do have their press kit all set up with their rate sheets and all that kind of stuff. Exactly. If that's something that works for you as a brand, go for it. If you feel like the brand has something more to offer that you might be able to negotiate with that influencer, that's an individual case by case basis as far as the discussion. Hopefully as a brand, you have also set forth, look, this is, this is influencer marketing, something that I know I want to do. Here are the guidelines for how, as the brand, I'm going to engage an influencer. And you basically just have to have that, each new influencer, you're going to have to have that conversation and work that out. The nice thing is, so the beauty of influencer marketing from my perspective is whereas when social media first opened up to us and allowed us to engage with practically anybody, it's like, oh yay, we can be friends with all of our customers. That's not really easy to do. It's not cost effective, it's difficult to scale. What is scalable though is that one-on-one -on -one relationship between you, the brand, and that influencer because each of you as the brand and as the influencer represent a huge audience setting. Now that one-on-one -on -one relationship actually does become scalable because of the efforts that both you as a brand and them as the influencer can leverage both of those audiences to the benefit of the other. But it is a relationship and you are going to have to have that ongoing conversation. So, so you talked about uh, PPC and uh, placements and social for uh, for for like mentions and, and targeting journalists and things like that. So I'm trying to think of how that ad copy would play out. Is it are you are you trying to get that in their newsfeed as and and maybe look like it's organically there even though it's sponsored? So it's just kind of like exciting new study by blah blah blah, you know. Or is it more of a call to action to a journalist? Um, it kind of depends on the piece. I know. Um, most of the ones that I do, it's usually some sort of informational piece. It's more about putting a little bit of data forward. The best tactic that I found for doing paid placement for influencers, and particularly for the journalist audience, is to go ahead and either articulate that unique newsworthy piece of the information. So for um, my men mal client, it was like, we use lawyers, not claims adjusters. We put that very far forward in all of the copy around it and it got picked up. Um, statistical data usually gets um, a lot of attention, especially from journalists um, in the newsfeed. And again, we're reaching them when they're not really in work journalist mode. They're, they're just like all the rest of us scrolling through our Facebook feed. Oh, that's kind of interesting. I think I'll put that in my research folder for later. So again, like I said, by the time they've at least consumed it, they've become a little bit familiar. They've, we've gotten a brand impression out of them. And by the way, if you can package that with video, oh my gosh, it's so cheap. Um, most of the paid placement that I've been doing for um, video views and Facebook has been running me one, two, three cents in 10 second video view. If I can articulate the information that I need that journalist to have in 10 seconds of video on Facebook, I can reach that audience really, really inexpensively and then follow on with the press release email as usual. Again, we see a lift in open rates for that sort of engagement where we kind of seeded the conversation in paid social and then sent them the email. Has someone like, ever, like, if I'm an account manager and I've never done um, and influencer marketing, how would I approach that with a new client and what like KPIs and metrics uh, would I be saying like by the end of Q3 or whatever, um, you'll be seeing these things like a brand lift, like w what should I be looking for from like an agency perspective? As oh far God. as the types of KPIs, so we go yeah. back to what's the goal in the first place? Are we looking for an increase in backlinks for SEO benefit? That's a KPI. Are we looking for a lift in social media mentions where they're either mentioning the brand as text, they're sharing some kind of photo, or they're actually tagging the brand and leading people back to the social media? Those are all KPIs. We can we can set a goal of X number of um, mentions in a period of time to see if we can increase the level of visibility. One of the nice things is with engaging influencers. I can get around some of the algorithmic um, 
problems with, particularly with social media marketing. So if I'm having another individual talk about my brand rather than me getting filtered out of the Facebook newsfeed due to an algorithm because I'm a page and not a person, um, we're finding some really cool results with increased brand visibility organically even. So those, those are things that we can measure. So, you know, obviously, like, affiliate links are not a worthwhile right. uh, thing for us. So is there any, in your experience, KPIs that would be effective? Our goal is to get clients. Like, um, obviously, that can come from, yeah, we want them to get to the website, things like that. But it's more like we want them to, it's more like a referral base mm -hmm. thing for us. We want to build that relationship with the influencer, whether it be estate planning or things like that, based on the needs that you can kind of shop for on their Instagram feed. You know, if they're a right. young mom, okay, guardianship. Let's talk to them about maybe we can assist you with your plan and you can talk about how our service is working with them. But what's the measurable way to see what results are coming from that? Is it if you refer and say my name, is it is it that generic? So or is there's, there there's a lot of things. Obviously we can we can check for brand mentions. We definitely want to engage the traditional PR stuff with news mentions, stuff like that. Um, Basically, at the end of the day, my favorite KPIs have to do with audience acquisition. So, particularly in social media, we go back. I can go back to the video example again. If I'm doing a co-created video with another influencer, I can make sure that I've told Facebook that look, we're we're working together to create this content. I can use the audience created from watching it as well as they can, and retarget audiences based on their viewing habits. That is a quantifiable metric. I know, based on the number of views of that video, how many people I can retarget and, and take them to the next step and the next step and the next step. So audience acquisition metrics are really your best friend for a lot of stuff like that. with you specifically for local businesses and businesses that depend on storefront traffic I am more interested in the um, local validation so I'm looking for influencers that are also in the same geographic area that can point to um, additional location value in other words the topic expertise is the location that you're involved in so in that case, I'm probably looking for nonprofits. I'm looking for little league teams. I'm looking for event sponsorship in my local area that I can then leverage that as influencer marketing. Um, slightly different flavor, but I'm finding that that local referral, even though the um, page rank might not be particularly high, the dom domain authority may not be very high, but because it is local, and Google knows that it's local, it's highly valuable to me to do so. So for example, I mean, we work with my newsletter, mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering like, if that, I don't know, I don't know if it brings awareness, if it actually like has, brings us results. Um, I would say in that case, you want to make sure that not only does that particular celebrity have the type of visibility that you're looking for, but is there a relevance fit, in other words, does it make sense for him to talk about that particular topic as far as you're concerned? If there is that additional topic relevancy, I'd say, yeah, go for it. Um, and then how are you doing that? Like, we mainly use Instagram. You can't really link on Instagram, obviously. How do you turn that into more than just getting him post engagement? Right. Um, I go back to video because okay. in, in the um, Facebook Instagram ecosystem, even though it might have been an Instagram video, I can still leverage the um, viewing audience for that in order to take the next step. You might wind up starting the engagement in Instagram and winding up in Facebook later, but that's okay. What are your best tips for taking like, a casual hair replacement and turning it into a, a solid relationship? You know, I've gotten a few hair replacements and then afterwards I'm like, hey, right. let's, let's be friends, you write for other stuff. 
but but they kind of go cold. Like, how do you take that um, one time? That's, that's making sure that you keep coming back to them. So Courtney Levia is actually an excellent example of this. So my first touch with Courtney was Ford Bustle, which is an online women's magazine. She had a horror request, if I remember correctly, it was for information about dry shampoo. And it just so happened that the scientist who formulated the Illumi product is a microbiologist, and he actually had some very interesting information about how damaging constant use of dry shampoo could be to your hair. It's like something that you only want to use occasionally. But he was so articulate about it that she really, this was information that she hadn't even been expecting and it was so outstanding. She's like, I'm going to use this. She used the full quote. I guarantee you the quote was like probably 200 words. It was a really long quote. But she liked it so much that she used it. Um, she followed up with us and made sure that we knew when the actual article went live so that we as a brand could share it, engage with it, that sort of stuff, use it for our PR. And obviously by the time she told us we had her direct email rather than her Haro email because she was following up with us that way. Now that I have her email, I can always email her back and say, oh, hey, we're, we're launching a new product. Would you like to possibly partner up with us again to talk about dandruff shampoo or whatever else might be relevant to her and her audience? So, yes, I have had several instances where once I initiated that relationship with a writer with a journalist and on Haro, I could continue that engagement. Uh, curious, so I did a little research, um, so I got a new book coming out. Uh, curious if you've done any influencer marketing yourself for the release of Flight of the Sirens. Oh, thank you so much. So, he just mentioned my novel that I have on Amazon. Um, yes, actually, I am currently in the process of writing my second um, book. I am working on the draft of the manuscript right now, and one of the things that I'm doing along with that is I want to take that publication to traditional publishing. I would like to get um, a literary agent. I'd like to go the traditional public publishing route. and. In that case, for me and this particular project, those literary agents then become the influencers that I'm trying to market to. So yeah, right now I am in the process of cultivating and creating a list of literary agents that I can market my story to, hopefully to get a contract and, and start the next step in the process. So thank you very much for mentioning the book. <laughs> no, I didn't. I really didn't. I'll catch you up here later. <laughs>